I've only written one book, so when I gave Bob War and Redemption, I got four in return. <laughs> and um, I read Deep Change and Change the World just continuously. And uh, uh, it explained to me all the, time, all the reasons why I had failed as a leader, and it explained to me why I had succeeded. And it was very illuminating. It was a wonderful thing to do, and uh, uh, I hope to continue to benefit from it. I, uh, <clears throat> I want to tell you a little bit about what we're going to try to do today. Bob outlined some of it. I'm going to try to explain to you, I'm not a combatant. I've never had to kill anyone. I've never uh, suffered any uh, real serious uh, psychological trauma. I've been in a few things where people have died, but nothing like what happens in war. I'm going to try to explain to you what I think war is really like from my perspective as a non-combatant, what I've learned from talking to veterans for 30 years. Uh, I'm going to try to explain to you then what is helpful from a clinical standpoint to these veterans. And then I'm going to go beyond that and try to explain to you what makes the most difference in their lives for their positive recovery and what they do that really allows them to recover positively. I want you to just take a, a look at this, uh, this piece of art. Do any of you know what this is right here? It's an AK-47. How do you know that? Right. So you know what it is. It's a, uh, it's a I don't know, the AK-47, when was it first manufactured? Uh, 1960s? Late 50s. And it is, uh, it is uh, still uh, a favorite weapon all over the world. Uh, you can get dirt in it. You can get it really messy. It'll still work. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very good gun to kill people with. And that's what the artist, who is a Vietnam combat veteran, is trying to show. This is not something you hunt anything other than people with. This is a self-portrait by this artist. Now, this is a Vietnam vet. He allows me to use his art. Uh, he's telling us some very important things about what he thinks about his uh, combat experience. Let's just look at this a little bit. I'm not an art uh, a person, but I know a little bit about this. What's he got right here? So, yeah, bronze star or silver star. It's a decoration for heroism. What's he got in his pouch? He's got the head of, a, of someone he's killed in his pouch. Who's he saying he is? He's the Grim Reaper, yeah. Who's the enemy? They're grim, they're, they're grim Reapers as well. He's telling you. Now, there was a time uh, when we were doing um, Rorschachs on World War II veterans. We, I mean psychiatry, was doing Rorschachs on World War II veterans. And we were saying that they were psychotic because they would come up with images out of this on the Rorschach test. Okay? Uh, but they weren't psychotic. They had just gone through the experiences of war. <clears throat> so... One of the things I encountered as my work as a, a young psychiatrist with the Department of Veterans Affairs was that <coughs> war was not at all what I thought it was. Um, at one point early on, I got together a group of World War II veterans and formed a World War II veterans combat group. And this group had been going for about two years when this man, Ed, made this statement to the group. He said, aren't we all murderers? Now, I knew these men very well. I had no conception that they would think of themselves as murderers. These are, these are men who were old enough to be my father. They had children, grandchildren. And I'm looking around when he makes that statement, and they're all nodding in agreement. And I wanted to just run out of the room and never participate in that group anymore. Um, I was devastated by that statement and by their acknowledging that and wanting to talk about that. I could not hear them talk about this. I was not ready to do that. Let me just tell you a little bit about Ed. <clears throat> Ed's wife brought him into treatment with me. Uh, she brought him in because she got up one morning and he had dug a foxhole in the night in the middle of their front lawn. And he was in the foxhole. He had his weapons laid out just like he would have them laid out when he was with the 10th Mountain Division in Italy. Uh, he had his ammo set up. 
And she said, what if someone had stumbled into our yard in the night? What would have happened? You would have killed him. He could not deny to her that he, that might have happened. Uh, he had never done anything like that before. She packed him up and drove 100 miles to the Boise VA, and I happened to see him. As I mentioned, Ed was in the 10th Mountain Division, which, is, uh, which in World War II was a special unit that was informed in World War II to, to be uh, a winter warfare unit. And uh, a lot of men uh, were recruited from the, from the Intermountain West, from uh, Utah, Idaho, Colorado, Montana, people who could ski and had some experience with the outdoors were recruited and formed in this unit. <clears throat> they went over to Italy in 1944 and fought for most of a year in the, in the Apennines Mountains and in the, in, the, in the rough terrain of that part of Italy. It was a non-mechanized war. They used mules to get their equipment around. Ed uh, was a scout for that company. He was 18. Uh, he had been married three months when he joined the Army. Um, and uh, <clears throat> he was an excellent shot, and he was a very crafty woodsman. Um, at one point, they're laying down a covering fire. That is, they're trying to assault a German position in a stone, two-story stone farmhouse. And there's a machine gun in the second story. That he's laying down a covering fire on the front door, shooting at anything that moves. A shape moves across the door. He shoots it. Uh, uh, it falls down. It doesn't look like a soldier. Uh, they eventually drive the, the Germans out of that position, and he gets to the farmhouse in time to hold in his arms about a 10-year-old Italian boy that he shot and killed in that assault. Uh, at one point, his unit was overrun, and uh, uh, Ed was uh, trapped in a position that if he tried to flee to where his unit was, he would cross an open field of fire. He didn't want to be killed. He uh, pretended he was dead. He crawled underneath several bodies of his dead comrades, and lay under their bodies with the gore and their, their blood and guts dripping all over him for several hours until his unit retook the position and then he resurrected out from underneath those bodies. He was on a night patrol one night <clears throat> and um, he was briefly captured and two older German soldiers took him to a little woodshed where they were holding him and he became convinced that they were going to rape him. And uh, in uh, kind of the terror of that, there was a, one of them went outside to uh, uh, maybe use the bathroom or something, and the other one was just careless. He was a small man, uh, Ed was, and there was an old axe in the corner of the woodshed. He picked that up and killed the man who was in the woodshed with him, and when the second man came into the woodshed, he had killed him with that axe and hacked him to death. Uh, he was so distressed by that, he had blood all over him, as you might imagine, um, and had just killed two people with, a, with an axe. He crept out, washed himself off on a stream, and made it back to his lines, never told anyone in his unit what he had done. Um, <clears throat> there was another situation toward the end of the war where uh, he was out on a patrol, and he found a man from his unit, he didn't know him, who had received a large caliber shell into his abdomen and had blown his guts out of his abdomen and was lying on the ground. And when Ed came up to him, he said, please, please, please kill me. Please, please, please kill me. And Ed finally did that. He put his hand over his nose and his mouth and he suffocated him to death and put him out of his misery. Um, toward the last few weeks of the war, they were in northern Italy. Um, they were taking, going through a town, uh, clearing it out. And he came across, he, in the upstairs floor of a room, he came across a woman, a young woman, who had had her hands tied to the head of the bed and her feet tied together at the bottom of the bed. And she was pregnant. And she'd been put in that position at childbirth so that she would die in the most extreme agony. And the problem is, Ed was almost certain that that was the anti-fascist guerrillas who had done that, people on his side who had done that to her. And she was probably pregnant by a German soldier. And that was their... So when he got home, he just felt like he was on the wrong side of the pale. Uh, he couldn't go to church with his wife. As she said to me at one point, we were regular churchgoers before the war. He was a good Christian. He never could understand after the war how God could forgive him for all he had seen and done. It changed our life in that respect. He felt like a hypocrite going to church. We tried to go together for a while, but he was just too uncomfortable. Doug. Doug turned 17 in Korea. He had lied about his age. 
because his family was poor, his parents agreed. So he had been fighting in Korea for two weeks with a, uh, with, uh, a, a uh, very determined and combat experienced unit. He'd come in as a replacement when he turned 17. His, his, his platoon was, headed, was, was led by a, uh, an experienced sergeant from World War II. The officer had been killed a couple of times already in that platoon. The sergeant had just a couple of things to say to him and the other two replacements that showed up that day. First, he said, we never take prisoners. It's too dangerous. They'll have something on them. They'll blow you up if you take a prisoner. We never treat their wounded. We shoot their wounded and kill them and make sure they're dead. No prisoners, no wounded, no mercy. So he, he did that. Uh, he said, I killed people who pled for mercy with their eyes, who begged for mercy with their eyes, but I killed them anyway. Um, after about a year of that, he came home on a boat to uh, San Francisco. And um, he couldn't get off the boat. We were talking about that in group therapy one day. Why couldn't you get off the boat? He says, I don't know. I couldn't get off the boat. And then he sent me a Christmas card two weeks later. And this is what he said in the Christmas card. I still have that Christmas card. The reason I was afraid getting off the boat coming home in 1952 was I felt like I had left my poor soul in Korea, and that's not good. So, for most human beings, it is acceptable to kill a dangerous beast, a threatening animal, but it is not acceptable to kill a real human being. The enemy has to be a Nazi, a terrorist, a gook, an infidel, a capitalist, a godless devil. They can't really be human. They can't be part of our tribe. A uh, quote from a Marine general, I just took this out of a, our daily newspaper before the second assault on Fallujah. There are only thugs, mugs, terrorists, and murderers in there. Uh, one of my special forces officers who I've treated for over 20 years, he just died last year, he said, even after all he'd done, I said, I had to pretend I was killing a cobra coiled to strike. If I didn't, it was almost impossible to take that first shot. But we have to dehumanize the enemy to kill him. That's what propaganda is about. Little Russian propaganda. What, what are they telling us? What are they telling us? Yeah, and then they're going to eat him after they've done that. So, you know, that's a monster. You can kill that. That's not a human being. An American poster from World War II. What are they telling us? Can you negotiate with that person? Is there any chance of negotiation? No, no. There's no chance of negotiation. You want him to shoot you? You want that bullet? You want him to shoot people you love? You want that bullet? The only way you can stop him is take him out. He's not, he's beyond feeling. This is a very successful Canadian bonds poster. You know, the enemy is, un, is inhuman. But, so, we basically have to turn the enemy, our troops have to turn the enemy into someone other than a human being. You have to do that. You have to protect yourself emotionally. They can't really be. But you know what? Our troops are too smart for that. Sooner or later they realize, and it's usually sooner, that the other guy is just a dumb person like them, fighting for something that they believe in. It becomes very difficult to keep that at a distance. Um, I had an elderly man in my office about 20 years ago, Idaho farmer. He had been part of the uh, 77th Infantry Division, which fought in the South Pacific. He was a very good machine gunner. And uh, he was coming to the end of the battle to retake Guam. And uh, it was broad daylight. And about 11 or 12 Japanese soldiers jumped up about 200 yards away from his machine gun and charged his machine gun in broad daylight. He had never had such easy kills. He just locked and loaded and killed them all. They waited around for a couple hours. Nothing else happened. Finally, they went out to field strip him. And he and a couple of his buddies crawled out and uh, began field stripping. And the first thing they noticed is that the Japanese had no ammunition. So they'd simply used his machine gun as a way to kill themselves. And then he said, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I reached in and pulled out a man's wallet and I opened it up. And what did I see? What did he see in the wallet? He saw a picture of a young woman with a little baby. 
just like his wife back home. He said, the war was never the same for me after that. I could, not, I could no longer kill with impunity. <clears throat> now, there's a number of kinds of killing that go on in war. <clears throat> um, so, the first kind of killing is we're killing enemy combatants. And we try to keep a distance from that. We try to make sure that uh, in our understanding as we're doing that, that they're, they're not really human beings. They're terrorists. Uh, they deserve to die. There's nothing else we can do. But that breaks down. After a while, we know we're killing human beings. But then we're also killing civilians. You know, Ed killed that little Italian boy. You cannot have a war in Europe, which is the most densely populated continent in the world, and not kill civilians. Every infantryman in World War II knows this story. You're trying to capture a village. The Germans have uh, the best machine gun in World War II, the M60 machine gun, uh, a crew at the top of, the, of one of the best, biggest, solid, most solid buildings in the town, uh, say on the second story. They're shooting, they're shooting you. They're covering the streets. Uh, you've got a suppressive fire to try to keep that machine gun down. Um, uh, a couple of men, when they're, you're suppressing the fire, run up to the uh, side of the stone wall building, throw two or three grenades into the first floor, blow it up, break down the door, hear some noise in the basement, throw two or three grenades down into the basement. They're shooting through the floor at the machine gunners on the, on the second floor. Uh, they take some casualties. They eventually kill the Germans. At the end of that, they go down into the basement to see who's there and who's there. Who did they blow up with their grenades? It's a young French family, a woman, three or four children. That's who they killed with the grenades. So that is over and over. You're constantly, what are the, you know, the, the sanitized version is collateral casualties. You're constantly doing that. Um, this little bit of research from uh, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, 2004, followed two Marine brigades and two Army brigades in the first assault in Iraq. And one of the questions they asked the soldiers after they returned was, were you responsible for the death of a non-combatant? 28% of them said yes. They wouldn't say that now. There's been too much negative press about this kind of thing. But 28% of them said, yes, I'm responsible for the death of a non-combatant. 83% of them said they saw women and children who were horribly injured that they could not help. Um, then there's killing each other. How often does that happen? Uh, our smart bombs fail. Our intelligence is bad. Uh, we're in the middle of a firefight at night, and uh, we kill each other. Um, we're, between, uh, we're, we're assaulting an enemy unit uh, in between two units, and we kill each other. We don't know who our own personnel are in the middle of a firefight, but it happens over and over. The first time I was introduced to this was a, was a sailor who was on the cruiser Raleigh at Pearl Harbor <coughs> uh, on December 7, 1941. And... Uh, the cruiser was sunk, but it was sunk in shallow enough water that they could continue to operate the anti-aircraft guns that were on the cruiser throughout the battle. Uh, and uh, he thinks that they did shoot down a Japanese plane, but later that afternoon, four American planes from the carrier Enterprise flew over Pearl, Har Pearl Harbor. He says he's, he's sure that he shot at least one of those planes down and killed the pilot. That's the thing that bothered him most the whole war. Um, <clears throat> and then there's just killings of hate and rage what I call battlefield justice. I've treated veterans from these two divisions, the 45th and the 42nd. They got to Dachau at about the same time. Now, the 42nd and the 45th Infantry Divisions land in Normandy uh, a few days after D-Day, so in June of 44. So from June of 44 until the end of the war, they're fighting the Germans across Europe. Those divisions would have lost, they would have taken somewhere around 200% casualties during that time. So you have a company of a couple hundred men. By the time they get to Dachau, there's two or three men left in that company who landed in Normandy in June of 1944. They've turned over that. The line companies have maybe turned over 800%. Okay? So they have seen more than their share, and they've been fighting that war that we're talking about all the way across Europe, they see these scenes as they get into Germany, and then they get to Dachau. And Dachau is just a nightmare. And who's responsible for that war? Those Nazi bastards. The, the guards surrender to them. 
Is that enough? Hell no. They line them up against this brick wall. The machine gunner gets down there and they execute them all right there. The machine gun just missed those three guys. They're going to get them in just a minute. And then the ones that aren't dead, they're going to go up and put a bullet in their head. And it seems like the right thing to do at the time. It's the end result of war. But how do you deal with that when you get home? What do you think about that when you get home? So, propaganda and racism can help start a war, but love makes a war possible. So as much as you learn to hate and to kill in war, and maybe even to kill with relish, maybe even to kill with real, not quite pleasure, because it's never pleasurable, but with um, vindictive justice, uh, if it wasn't for love in war, the war would just stop. Because it is the love that the combat units have for the members of the combat unit that after the propaganda breaks down, allows them to keep killing to protect their buddies and to accomplish their mission. It is the love for each other that allows them to continue to go into life-threatening danger over and over and over again with their unit. That esprit de corps is the power that allows the war to continue. Um, they will risk anything for each other. As this World War II Marine t said, in war, loyalties shrink down past country and family to one or two men who will be with you. They become more important than anyone else in the world, more precious than father, mother, sister, brother, wife, and girl. That love is the ironic fuel. Or as this, uh, as Colonel Moore, now General Moore, said in his uh, book, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, another and far more transcendent love came to us unbidden on the battlefields as it does on every battlefield in every war man has ever fought. We discovered in that depressing hellish place where death was our constant companion that we loved each other, we killed for each other, we died for each other, and we wept for each other, and in time we came to love each other as brothers. So here are the two forces, propaganda and love, for beginning and continuing war. <clears throat> You've got to have the propaganda to start it. The enemy has to be less than human. They have to have done something nasty. They have to be threatening our tribe, our nation, our people in some awful way. And it ha we have to be justified in what we do. But then when we start doing it, we form these powerful, loving teams, and a combat team could not be more powerful and loving. The threat of death, the dependence on, uh, dependency on each other, the time you spend with each other, form bonds of love that are, that are just tremendous. Uh, but the cost is terrible for those who fight. If you're going to war with people who you love at least as much as your family, what happens when they're killed? What happens if you're separated from them and they're still in danger? What happens if you sometimes fail to do your duty in your eyes and one of them gets killed? The only thing that's worse than killing other non-combatants and other people in war is doing your duty 99% of the time and one time you feel like you failed in your duty and one of those beloved comrades gets killed because of that. So we have this problem of killing. Is it still around? Has it always been around? How about a poem from World War I? There's a bunch of British poets who wrote poetry about their war experiences that I think uh, is some of the best poetry, best writing about war ever. Ivor Gurney fought, fought in the trenches <clears throat> in 1915. He wrote the following poem called The Target. The Target, I shot him and it had to be one of us. Twas him or me. Couldn't be helped and none can blame me for you would do the same. My mother, she can't help, she can't sleep for fear of what might be happening here to me. Perhaps it might be best to die and set her fears at rest. For worst is worst and worry's done. Perhaps he was the only son. Yet God keeps still and does not say a word of guidance anyway. Well, if they get me, <clears throat> excuse me, first I'll find that boy and tell him all my mind and see who felt the bullet worst, and ask his pardon if I durst. All's a tangle, here's my job, a man caught, 
might rave or shout or sob, and God, he takes no sort of heed. This is a bloody mess indeed. This was said to me approximately three weeks ago. Let's see, when was it said to me? This was said to me in my office on the 15th of June. This vet served two months, two seven-month tours in Iraq with the Marines in 2004 and 2005. He was in intense combat in Fallujah and Ramadi. He was the radio man for a heavy weapons company. Quote, I killed people, and I saw a lot of killing of all types, end quote. I think about that a lot. Even before we went over, we knew the weapons of mass destruction thing was bogus. We were mercenaries. We were getting paid. The people we killed were getting nothing. They were just fighting for their homes. It doesn't make much sense to me why we were there. We had to kill to keep from being killed and to protect our buddies. I think about this a lot and try to make sense of it. A medic for the 101st Airborne, who I have <coughs> kept up an email therapy with. We do a lot of weird therapies <laughs> now that I never would have conceived of. Wrote the following to me. <clears throat> this was back September 23rd, 2007. He said, I am usually pretty respectful when I treat wounded insurgents. They might have valuable intel, and if not, I can always use the practice. I got mad only once. I had just come off two weeks mid-tour leave, and I was still feeling refreshed from it. We had responded to a route clearance convoy that was hit by an IED. Air weapons team was in the area and spotted suspected trigger men. They walked us onto them, and we started to search them. The helicopters then noticed three men coming towards us, attempting to ambush us 500 meters to the south. You understand that all this is going on in the middle of the night. The Apaches strafed them twice, with 30 millimeter grenades. <clears throat> when we maneuvered to the site, we found two men alive, but in bad shape. I started to treat them when someone noticed the third man under a bush. It looked as though he took a direct hit to his lower back. His hips were mostly gone, and his legs were only connected by a few strands of skin, along <clears throat> with other injuries. I began to, to apply pressure to the massive wound, but it was ineffective because my hand simply disappeared six inches into his body. I looked at what was left of his face, and it did not hide the pain he was in. I started talking to him to keep him awake, but that quickly became yelling. I feel bad now. I took out my anger on him verbally as I was treating him. I was mad because it was 3 a.m. on a Friday, <clears throat> and the mission should have ended hours ago. I was mad because I was still, if I was still home on leave, I'd, <clears throat> uh, if I was still home on leave, I'd probably be at a party with my friends. I was mad because when I called home in a few hours, isn't that weird? For me, you can just call home in a few hours after this. It's weird for me. When I called home in a few hours, no one would understand what I had just experienced. I was mad because his eyes were screaming at me. I was mad because this guy had 20 minutes left on earth and he didn't know it. I kept shedding his eyelids as I was treating him to save me from his pleading glare. I would shut them and he'd reopen them. This went on two or three times until eventually his eyes remained closed and he died. I checked his pulse to make sure and then went to help the combat lifesavers with the other patients. On the drive back, I checked my watch to see what time it was. I could not read what time it was because my watch was covered in a thick coat of dried blood. Their blood obscured my watch much in the same way that it obscured our motivations for fighting this war. <clears throat> These are the kind of things that trouble... <clears throat> are men and women who have to fight war. <clears throat> well, part of our problem in my profession and part of the thing I had to overcome is <clears throat> we're not trained to treat killers. We're trained to treat victims. But our troops are trained to kill. And I haven't, you know, if you look at, you know, our, let's say our army, you know, only a very small proportion of our troops are going to be at the point of the spear where the killing is taking place. Yet they all participate in that, just as we all, as a body politic, participate in it by sending our troops off to do this. At the same time, <coughs> I see an inordinate number of those who have had to do the killing. And I wasn't trained in any way to understand how to respond to that 
or to deal with that. I won't take you through all of my struggles to become a therapist who could actually hear that kind of thing from my patients and could effectively deal with, deal with them, but it took me a good decade and a lot of failed treatments before my veterans had trained me enough that I could do a decent job with their comrades. We don't like to deal with the killing, and that's why we're at War and Redemption, was to try to help my fellow therapists not have to take as long as I did to get to the point that it could be helpful to them. And our usual treatments that we use for ordinary PTSD when you're a victim don't work so much with the outside the wire people who have been doing the killing. <coughs> there is this as well. The veteran will discuss almost everything but the killing. Uh, it is usually the most difficult of all topics to be explored, but over the course of their life, as they go through stages of life from their young adulthood through becoming, develop, becoming young parents on through their working careers in the end, it is the thing that as time goes on bothers them the most in my experience. But their reluctance to talk about the killing combined with our reluctance as therapists to listen to it and our feelings of inadequacy in doing anything about it combine to a lot of therapeutic denial. So we first have to address our reasons for not wanting to listen to the realities of war, which I've tried to introduce to you a little bit in this. And then when we get over that, maybe we can start allowing our patients to talk to us about what they really want to talk to us about. Well, what do we do? <clears throat> the most helpful thing first is to simply listen. And when you listen, you begin with a lot of grief. Now let's think about what happens in war. You cannot allow yourself to grieve in war. You cannot allow yourself to feel many feelings at all other than anger. And you cannot allow your anger to get out of control either. You'll do stupid things. So basically in war, you have to put a very powerful emotional denial and numbing on yourself. You have to control your feelings in a way that you have never controlled your feelings before. Because if you do not, you will do something stupid. You will not protect your buddies something really worse will happen, and so you learn to do that. <clears throat> how do you undo that? Now, also in war, we've talked about how you have learned to love, often at a level you've never learned to love before. And you've learned to hate at a level you've never learned to hate before. <clears throat> so we have to listen. It's important to get to that grief and allow those feelings to be talked about. We educate them about what they've gone through in war, I like this World War, II, World War II Marine who talked about, what he, about fear. I got used to fear. It was like a scar or a limp that I had to learn to live with. I learned always to control what showed on my face, my hands, and my voice, and I let it rage on inside me. I never lost my fear, but I lost my fear of fear because it became such a familiar thing. Now, most people do not break down because of fear. Most combatants break down because of exhaustion, grief, and guilt. So, how does the recovery really start? The recovery really usually begins with an honest exploration of what they did and experienced. Honesty to themselves and to those few people that they trust becomes the beginning of a recovery. Where have you heard this before? I mean, being truthful, uh, you cannot continue to run from it. A lot, of, a lot of soldiers will inevitably run from it. Drinking and drugging is running from it. Not talking is running from it. Now, a lot of the times they won't talk about it because when they talk about it, people simply do not understand, and you can understand why people do not understand. How do you tell your wife what it was like to kill somebody with your bare hands? And how do you tell her that you enjoy doing it at the moment? One of my vets talked about a situation where he was at dinner with his fiancée and his father-in-law started to ask him about the war and he tried to talk about it and pretty soon everybody had left the room. 
And he said, I decided after that I could never really tell the truth about what I did in the war. <coughs> well, one, pe one group of people they can tell the truth to is other combatants, which is one of the reasons I'm a fan of group therapy. Uh, and I believe that my soldiers have learned that they can tell the truth to me. Now, one of the things that's helpful, <coughs> that I find helpful, is to look for the positive experiences. Now, people come to see me and they're, quote, patients, all right? But honestly, a lot of my patients are far stronger than I am. They have a lot of things that they're struggling with, but I don't consider them necessarily pathological. They're just responses to their war experiences. So one of the things I like to do is I like to get the full picture of what they did in the war. So I'm talking to this Marine who was at Guadalcanal. And we got on this topic, we were in group, we were group therapy, we got on this topic, and he was just totally silent. And finally, I turned to him and I said, did you ever save anybody's life? And he was embarrassed. Because what he had done, in Guadalcanal, there was a body of water off, the, off Guadalcanal called Iron Bottom Sound. And probably somewhere around 50,000 American and Japanese sailors were killed in Iron Bottom Sound. And the sharks got used to eating human beings. And if a human being was in that water, the sharks came. And the sharks from all around the Solomon Sea seemed to have gathered in Iron Bottom Sound. Now they had a little teeny group of airmen, Marine airmen, who were kind of the main bulwark against the Japanese while the Marines and the Japanese were fighting uh, over Guadalcanal. And this Marine knew how to swim, and he was, one of, he was a really good swimmer. And twice, pilots were shot down, were wounded in Iron Bottom Sound, and he swam out a half mile and brought him back. Well, we had to pry that story out of him, but it's important to know those kind of things and to hear those stories, those, those loving experiences, those kind of things. And <clears throat> as this group of uh, Marines that I talked about earlier that fought in Iraq who, remember, 28% of them said they were responsible for the death of a civilian. 19% of them admitted that they had saved the life of a soldier or a civilian as well. So I just like to have that full story. I like to hear that, those anecdote experiences, I call them. Laughter. Laughter is tremendously important. It, it changes the context in a dramatic way. So... <clears throat> Roger was a Marine in Vietnam. He was a forward artillery observer, so he's always in the hottest place in the combat. Uh, the, uh, the, the Viet Cong were always trying to kill him first. Uh, you know, they try to take out the artillery uh, and try to take out the eyes of the artillery, which is what he was. So he was in treatment with me. He's home from Vietnam for about 30 years. He loves to do garage sales. He, uh, he does it in a very military fashion. Uh, he gets the newspaper, he underlines the garage sales, he writes out the addresses, he figures out his route, and how he's going to do it, what he's going to get at each garage sale, or what he might get at each garage sale. He s takes his binoculars, he puts them in his car, he starts early, he goes to, to, to site number one about an hour before the sale starts, he watches the people putting out the stuff. As soon as he sees what he wants before the sale's even started, he gets out of his car, makes a beeline to the person, haggles with him about what he wants, and gets it and starts to leave. So he's doing this one Saturday morning. He's walking across this, this lawn, this long, uncut lawn, and he steps on something that goes crunch. I think maybe you know how, what, he, what, he, what he thinks he stepped on. Yes, he stepped on a bouncing, bouncing Betty. He's absolutely convinced. So what do you do when you step on a bouncing Betty? You freeze, and you push down harder. And then you look for your buddy to come up with his bayonet and put it underneath your boot. Can you imagine doing this for somebody? Put his, put his bayonet underneath your boot and hold down the mechanism because what's going to happen is a spring is going to pop this little explosive up out of the ground about the height of your gonads and blow up right here. So he's holding down the spring and then you take off your boot and you go get a rock and you come back and you put it on his bayonet and then you both walk away and breathe a sigh of relief. He's standing there 30 years after the war and he's, he's sure he's stepped on his, his amygdala 
His, his midbrain is saying, you've stepped on a bouncing Betty, do not move. He's looking around for a Marine. There's no Marines around. There's no bayonets around. There's just people coming and going. He looks down in the grass, and he can see that there's these little styrofoam peanuts, and he thinks he stepped on one of those, but he can't release himself. And then finally he starts to laugh, and then he's freed up. Well, that is a little small analogy of what laughter does for us. We make fun of our grimmest experiences. Uh, <clears throat> guy had both legs blown off, and all of his uh, right hand except for this finger and his thumb in a, in a booby trap. Uh, <clears throat> he's tootling around in his wheelchair. He says he's, he's, his left arm, which is his only good limb, his only really healthy limb, he's got to have rotator, surgery, rotor, rotator cuff surgery on that. He says, if they screw up this surgery, I could be handicapped. You know, you have to laugh at that. You have to laugh. You laugh at that, you know, then it takes the sting out of it. Well, we do use medications to help, help with sleepiness and irritability. But the greatest healing forces for these soldiers are totally outside of therapy and only accessible there. And what I've learned to do is to try to use those. So let's start with those. The first one is having the courage to face the truth and take corrective action. You simply have to look in your soul and the successful ones do this, and they just go over it. And it's interesting, I, I began seeing World War II veterans who had gone through the following cycle. This is how I began to really learn this from them. They'd gone through the following cycle. They had come home from the war. They would drank like fish for years and years and years. They had functioned. Because remember, we're talking about highly functional people who have been, had their characters strengthened by the fire of war. So they can have all kinds of symptoms and they can just keep functioning. They can have battle dreams all night. They can have intrusive thoughts in the daytime. Uh, they can feel numb inside. But they'll just keep doing their jobs because they learned to do that in the war zone and they can do that the rest of their lives. Uh, and they'll be doing that. But they'll still be drinking. And then sometimes their drinking becomes such a problem that they end up in AA. And they end up in treatment. And then they recover. And they use the 12 steps of AA. And maybe you're not familiar with those 12 steps, but the fourth step is you'll do a searching moral inventory of your life. And you will correct every wrong that you've committed to the best of your ability as long as doing that does not harm other people. And you will continue to do that every day. You'll do this searching moral inventory. And they'll come out of their alcohol and they'll start applying that fourth step to their war experiences. And this, for them, is the beginning of real healing from those experiences. Luther basically said, said uh, I know I killed children as we fought the Germans in France. I saw their little bodies bagel my, by my shells. I turned to drink as a way of forgetting. Just a typical statement from a, from a combat soldier. And yet he went through all of that. He has two beautiful poems in War and Redemption. He went through all of that and really began his recovery when he began applying the 12 steps of AA to his military experiences. Having the courage <coughs> to face the pain that's inside of you. Wayne talks about this. He was a long-range patrol specialist, a, a recon guy. I think anyone who chooses therapy is choosing life over death, but unless one is desperate and can admit that, there may not be intense incentive or strength to try finding those little patches of light. He's talking about the slow death that Bob Quinn talks about in Deep Change. He's talking about the slow death that can happen to you if you do not let yourself, if you do not face your emotions and face your pain. <clears throat> but unless one is desperate, there might be an incentive or strength to try finding those little patches of light. After 11 years in the system, I look back on those first five years and think now that my greatest comfort during that time was learning that I was not alone. The fellowship of vets from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam helped me find the strength to continue. This allowed me eventually to find a therapist who enabled me to connect the dots in my life and rediscover my feelings. To feel human again and find more patches of sun. The life without feeling was a lot less painful, but it was really no life at all. I am beginning to feel empathy and pain and sometimes joy, but these are closer to being human than to feel nothing at all. So this is, this is not some simple confrontation with the truth. This is layers and layers and, and work. <coughs> then, what do you do next? What is mercy? 
How do you define mercy? Anybody? What's your just a simple definition of mercy? What have you got when you have mercy? If I'm... Yeah, somebody's totally guilty of something, but you're not going to take vengeance on them because the opposite of mercy is vengeance, okay? Or just simple justice. So mercy is a position that if you can get to it, if a combatant can get to, get to it, and you start to get to it as you start to understand and look at your own pain, if you can get to mercy, many other things can follow. Because if you, you know, Victor... This special forces officer said, you have to give up even justified bitterness and hate to fully heal the emotional and spiritual wounds of war. Even justified bitterness and hate. Or Viktor Frankl talking about his Auschwitz survivors. Only slowly could these men be guided back to the commonplace truth that no one has the right to do wrong, not even if wrong has been done to them. Or this statement from Christ, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. So you're guilty of something, but the penalty isn't enacted upon you or somebody else is guilty of something and you don't want to enact it on them. That is the beginning of a process that if you let that continue, and most men and women can get to that, even with this kind of killing in their background, as they begin to look at themselves and understand themselves better, they can start feeling merciful thoughts toward themselves and towards they were, those who they were in combat with, maybe even towards those who have wronged them the most. Those merciful thoughts sometimes lead to, along with step four of AA, reparative acts. Now, my mother always taught me that you love those you serve. You love those you help. And I have seen that over and over in this area. So if combatants begin to get into the realm of mercy, they begin to get into the realm of reparative acts. They begin to start to try to apply, say, the fourth step of AA to their lives. They begin trying to do things that are helpful and reparative. The most successful combatants begin to do this. They become AA sponsors. They become EMTs, teachers, policemen, firefighters. They really are actually excellent. In any time anytime you're in a situation that it would be petrifying for the rest of us, they're really, really very good at that because they're so comfortable. I'm talking the point of the spear people. They're really very good at that um, in their lives. But this service begins to replace that numbness with more positive feelings. And mercy can enter in. And when mercy enters in, there's understanding and forgiveness that can eventually follow. Now, then there is the spiritual connection and recovery. So we've got <clears throat> kind of facing the truth and peeling back the layers of facing the truth and actually talking to people about that, other veterans, other therapists, your own family. There's <clears throat> starting to do reparative acts. Uh, and then for the most successful, there seems to be a very powerful spiritual connection to their recovery. Because you cannot individually repair what you've done in war. And most men and women seem to turn to some spiritual realm to find some connectedness to help them. Here's that special forces officer again. I want to say this, though, about all these quotes. <clears throat> I wrote this book in a few months. Um, uh, I say I wrote it, but... Really, I wrote it, and my wife made it so that you could all understand it. <laughs> Wave your hand, Teresa. She's an English teacher, and she's been working on me for a long time. And uh, so this is really as much her product as mine. But I wrote this in a few months, and then I said to myself, I can never publish this book. It's too, because I wrote it just like, I wrote the truth as I knew it. And I wrote the truth of the stories of these men as I knew it. And I said I could never publish it. Now, the men I was working with knew that I was writing this book. And they kept asking me about it. And I said, you know, it was just for me. I just wrote it for me. You know, I had to get it off my chest. I just wrote it for me. And they said, no, we don't accept that. I said, okay, so you don't, you don't know what I said about you. Okay? So over 45 men came in one at a time over a period of a number of months and sat down in my office and read everything I wrote about them. 
I'd put it up on the computer. They'd read it with me. And uh, they would correct it. They'd say, no, that isn't exactly how it was. And I'd type it in, and I'd type it. Like that statement from Wayne, we spent two hours on that statement. He said, no, no, you said that like you would say it. That isn't how I would say it. This is how I would say it. And every one of these statements, they did that too, and they corrected it. And then they would tell me, oh, I didn't tell you the rest of the story. Oh, you didn't? We've been working together for 20 years, and you haven't told me this whole story? No, 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 I didn't tell you this part. And then they'd tell me some other detail. We'd write that in. It, was, it wasn't therapy that I'd trained for, but it was fascinating. It was wonderful work. So Larry says this. He says, I ended my time in Vietnam angry and bitter. I saw so many good young people killed and wounded unnecessarily and foolishly. I blamed the enemy, but even more so I blamed our own military command and politicians for glory hunting and the stupid policies that got so many young men killed. You know, what really got him at this point is, <clears throat> you know, he's a special forces officer. He's used to killing. He's killed hundreds directly, thousands by calling in well-timed Napalm and artillery in just the right places when he was right there with the enemy. And uh, they were flying back from a mission. The helicopter had just picked them up, and they were flying back from a mission, and they got this emergency call. Hey, we've got lots of wounded. Anybody, can you come and help us? We don't have any helicopters coming to get us. And his pilot did not want to go, and he poked out his 45, and he said, we're going to get them. So they went to this hot LZ. They landed. They filled the helicopter full of wounded. He had one young man in his arms <coughs> who's lost both legs, has a tourniquet on both legs. And he's just crying and begging for his mother. And here's this guy. He's in his 40s. You know, killed hundreds of people, and he's holding them in his arms. He says he just begs for his mother all the way home, all the way back to the base, and he dies <coughs> before we land. And he said, I was so mad at that point because we weren't doing anything useful. <laughs> I was so mad at that point, I almost left the military. Anyway, so it says, but this is what he says. What I found, though, is that holding on to that bitterness, holding on to that bitterness and hate keeps the wounds of war open. Well, first you're, you know, who do you blame? You know, you blame the enemy. You blame the Viet Cong. You blame the North Vietnamese. You blame the Iraqis. You blame the Afghanis. Then sometimes you get over that. And then you blame our government. Uh, you know, then you blame whoever. But eventually, you have to give it all up. Because blaming does nothing for your soul. It just cankers your soul. You have to give up even justified bitterness and hate to fully heal the emotional and spiritual wounds of war. God can help you do this, but you have to help yourself too. You have to keep working on this in therapy. The memories never disappear. The anger can be reactivated by current events. You have to keep praying and getting help to stay on track. I cannot do it on my own. I need continued therapy as well as prayer to keep from slipping back into anger. Now, these are very productive men. I don't want you to misunderstand who I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who have the strength to just keep going in their lives and doing what they need to do. Um, but they tell me these kind of stories. I mean, I've, I've given this lecture to psychiatric audiences. I've had psychiatrists come up to me afterwards. I had one come up and say, you can't talk about religion like that. Are you some kind of psychiatric traitor? I mean, he was, he was, he was, he was almost, I thought he was going to have a seizure. <laughs> he was so upset with me. I had a, I had a, minister just a couple of weeks ago, I was, I was giving a talk, and he said, you're in my territory. Get out. <laughs> I said, look, I'm just telling you what people tell me, you know. So, oh, I love Guy. Guy is a guy who got his legs blown off and just had this piece of hand. My partnership with God kept me alive. When I awoke from the coma induced by my wounds and surgeries, the first person I saw in Da Nang was a nurse from my hometown. I felt God brought her there to give me the courage to live. I promised her I would see her there at home in a year at church, and I would be walking. God helped me keep that promise. I prayed constantly. I would ask for the strength to overcome the hurdle in front of me at that time. I would feel peace and strength from God each time I got over the hurdle. It gave me greater faith to get over the next. 
I learned that God answers the prayers of anyone who says, I can't do this without you. I need help. All they needed was to have the courage to keep trying and asking and receiving the help God would send in the form of his children. So this depth of spiritual experience, what, I, what I've seen is traditionally, I think for, let's just take an average, people lose their spirituality in war. They feel alienated from God and humanity by their war experiences. They've got to get over that alienation toward humanity, and most of them, when they really heal, come back to a spiritual level of connection with the divine that is tremendously important and tremendously personal for them. So this is, let's, let's see, I'm trying to think of the time. We're bombing the Serbs in Belgrade. It's over Bosnia, right? Clinton's president. So what time is it? 1994? I have two World War II groups going at that time. And the Bosnians have never caught up with modern dress. So in the eyes of my World War II veterans, when they see pictures of the Bosnian refugees, it's just like being back in World War II in Europe and seeing all the refugees in Europe. So I'd never had this happen with my World War II groups, but they just got consumed with that war, and Milosevic was Hitler, and I couldn't get him off politics. And we have a five-minute politic rule in the group. You can talk politics for five minutes, and then we've got to put that stuff aside and get down to the business of therapy. Um, and I, I said, I, I had to take over the group. I said, okay, we've got to do this. I said, and I, so I brought in a blackboard, and I said, let's make a list of all the things that have been most helpful to you over the course of your lives in recovering from your war. And this was the list they made. Okay, so look at some of the things I made. And then at one point, I had, them, I, I had both groups. I gave them a little questionnaire, and I said, this is the closest I've ever gotten to research in my life. I, I gave them a little questionnaire, and I said, uh, mark if it's the number one thing for you, or if it's in the top three, or if it's in the top five. So mark it one, two, three, four, or five, and don't mark it at all. So, you know, pets did pretty well. Medications didn't do so good. Humor, okay, but here's the big ones. Being busy, doing service to others, okay? Spiritual issues, loving spouse and family, relationship with comrades and friends. Let's talk a little bit about this. We, we worked on this for six months, and finally they kind of came to the conclusion that one and two were the same. Three and seven were the same, and four and five were the same, and they wanted to put pets in with four and five, okay? And they called it the big three. So this is what they said, the big three after Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt, okay, World War II vets. So the big three are staying busy doing good, spiritual activity, and healthy, loving relationships. How do those work? I just want to read you... I just want to read you a quote from a Vietnam combat veteran. I don't know what is left of it, my post-traumatic stress disorder, but you ask what I did to dial down that rage. I think fundamentally, specifically with my wife, and it was his second wife, I let her love me. This isn't some purposeful thing I started out to do, but looking back, I let myself be loved, and over time, I wanted to be worthy of that love powerful, healing relationship. Uh, the spiritual activity we've talked some about. The staying busy doing good. It is just essential. Um, even my disabled vets, they've got to have something busy to do. I use this all the time in therapy. This is my basic, where are we? You can live, you can live with one of these three. You can live pretty well with two of these three. You want to live a rich life, you've got to have all three of these. Well, what time are we at? Okay. Uh, how about if I tell you one story, and then we just get your thoughts and have your... So this, this man, Jed was a sergeant in the 2nd Infantry Division in Korea. 
he was an artillery uh, sergeant, so he ran a battery of artillery guns. Um, he also served as a forward artillery observer. He got very close to the men he served with and led. Quote, it is impossible to express how deeply you felt about the men you fought with and how, their deaths, how much their deaths hurt. I loved my parents and was very sad when they died, but it hurt me more to lose my comrades than to see my parents pass on. In February of 1951, Jed's unit was nearly surrounded, then they had to fight for their lives. Quote, I had just emptied two clips of ammo into a group of Chinese right in front of our trench, killing several, when a man near me suddenly stood, threw down his weapon, and raised his arms in surrender. Surrender was not in my vocabulary. I was ready to fight until I was killed. I nearly shot the man who surrendered. <clears throat> but many others were surrendering also. Instead, I turned and ran. As I did so, I took a slug through both lungs. The Chinese stripped me of my overcoat and boots and left me there to die. This is February in Korea. And left me there to die as they rounded up the rest of the men who had surrendered. I'm not sure how I lived through that night. My woolen underwear helped, but with, but with the wound I had, I should have died within a few hours, if not minutes. The next day, an officer appeared. He had all the POWs who could walk sent back under guard toward China. A buddy whose leg was shattered by a bullet and I were dragged into a farmer's hut. I know they thought we would just die. I guess God had other plans. So Jed and his buddy lay neglected for a month in that hut just behind the Chinese lines near the 38th parallel. Quote, the Chinese provided us no care of food. Occasionally we were beaten or kicked, and one of my ribs was broken during one of the beatings. But we couldn't get away, so we were not guarded very closely. A Korean farmer was being forced to cook for the Chinese soldiers. Each night he would bring us water and the burnt rice scraped from the pots he cooked with. That burnt rice tasted like candy. He risked his life for us. The Chinese would have killed him if they had ever caught him feeding us. I love him and owe him so much. How I'd like to find him and thank him. So a month later, the Americans retook the position and found Jed and his buddy uh, on the verge of death in this little hut. Um, he got home. He was spent about a year in the hospital. He got home. He was, I was drinking heavily to try to sleep and forget the war. And I was going nowhere until I met my wife. Meeting her, meeting her prompted him to, quote, seek a work with a future. He was hired as a civilian by the Air Force and trained and eventually became an electronics engineer. The birth of my daughter sobered me up. Here was a little creature I could totally love. Somehow she softened my heart. I knew I had to stop drinking for her, and I did. Follow the relationships. In 1963, the slug he picked up in Korea that had lodged near his heart was finally removed at the VA. It is starting to irritate his heart and had to be taken out. So that's where we leave, leave off his story. Let's pick it up again. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, he said, the birth of my daughter sobered me up. Here was a tiny creature I could totally love. Somehow she softened my heart. I said to myself, my God, I've got to get my life in order. I stopped drinking. It was hard, but love motivated me, and I did it. I forced myself to stop thinking about the war. Every day I would get up, and thoughts of the war would just start bubbling up. I made myself think about other things. I concentrated on the needs of the here and now and worked hard. This was a turning point for me. I seemed to recover enough from the war to make a decent life for my family and myself. So he's got two of the three legs. He's got work that he's working hard. He's got loving relationships. He's got his wife and his, his daughter. But 30 years after the war, Jed sought psychological treatment for the first time, so he becomes my patient. He notes, it had been 30 years of not sleeping. I didn't sleep even after I stopped drinking. I was tired and struggling with depression, and he was having combat dreams every night. Medication and group therapy provided something, or some relief, but the killing he had done bothered him deeply. He said, I had helped kill or kill directly a lot of North Korean and Chinese soldiers. I didn't hate them. They came from poor families just like me. The killing you have done disturbs you even more after you have a family. You see then how bad the killing really is. I still hated that American, though, who started the surrendering. I still blame myself for not shooting him when he first stood up and put up his hands. You know, people do that. They shoot each other in war, even our own troops when they do something really stupid. 
that endangers everybody else. Just thought I'd mention that if you hadn't picked that up. Finally, I realized that I would have blamed myself just as much now if I had shot him. As I prayed about it, I could see that shooting him would have been worse for me. I am not sure I could ever have ever lived with myself. As my children grew up, I began praying again. I couldn't understand why God had kept me alive. I knew that after being shot in both lungs and stripped of my coat and boots and abandoned, I should have died. I knew only God could have kept me alive. Why was I saved? I started praying and railing at God. Why did you save me? What did you keep me alive for? <clears throat> I had been praying like this for 20 years. A little over a year ago, I was carrying groceries into the house when I heard a voice in my head say, Love me. I knew God had wanted me to love him. I knew it meant living a life that was pleasing to God by helping others all I could and doing good with all the blessings I had received. God allowed those words to sound in my head, and my heart rejoiced. I felt I finally knew what God wanted from me. I kept trying to contact the men I served with. What he did was he used a lot of resources to track down everybody in his unit. He found that all the men who had surrendered were killed. In fact, they never made it to the POW camp. Sometime, somewhere between the place they surrendered and where they were taking them, they were all killed. None of the men survived. He would find those men one by one. If they were in difficult circumstances, he wasn't a wealthy man, but he had some resources. He and his wife would help them out. They would look them up. If they needed help, he'd help them. If they needed guidance, if they needed to get into treatment, he'd help them do that. Uh, until he had a big stroke about three years ago and couldn't, couldn't do that anymore. Well, what am I trying to say? Let's kind of wrap it up. I argued earlier that one of the ironies of war is that love makes war possible. Without love for their comrades, most men could not continue to wage war. Combatants without the love that binds them to their fellows more readily succumb to cowardice or a sensible desire for safety, and they flee the battlefield. Combatants with deep love and loyalty to one another find the strength to overcome their fear of death and prevail as a team on the battlefield. This deep love also creates some of the greatest pain from war, the profound heartbreak of having beloved comrades killed. But to continue loving is also the cure for war's emotional and spiritual trauma. The most successful post-war combatants surround themselves in a network of love. The reciprocal love of spouse, family, friends, and comrades sustains the heart and soul as it heals. Productive work and service are acts of love and private spiritual devotions and prayers help them feel connected to and blessed by a divine love. Acting on love and being truthful, merciful, and forgiving after their wars generate hope in the combatants' hearts that reconciliation and peace are possible. It is a lifelong process. But for most combatants, their war experiences make them stronger, not weaker, in the end. Sometimes lead, lead them to be tremendous agents of change. Uh, just... <clears throat> you can enumerate a number of them in our political life, uh, in our business life, in our educational lives, who have done tremendous things, who, uh, who you may not be aware have gone through some of these extremely grim experiences, but have prevailed for those. Think of those three things. <clears throat> you know, loving relationships, spiritual connectedness, and staying busy doing good. Uh, those are the, those are the, those things are found over and over in stories of growth and development. So that's what I have to say to you today. Thoughts, responses. Well, I know you're working with some folks from more recent. Yes. Do you want to tell how that went in there? Um, well. They're pretty, they're pretty reluctant to see me because a lot of the ones I'm working with are currently in the Army National Guard. I was telling, uh, Paul, and, telling Paul and Diane beforehand that uh, <clears throat> uh, where I'm working right now in Salem is the headquarters of the Oregon National Guard. There are no, private, there are no active duty facilities there, so I'm seeing a lot of National Guard people who have eligibility for VA services for five years after they get out of their active duty stints. And about half of the current troop of troops deployed in Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere in the world are Army National Guard and Army Reserve and other National Guard units. So they're still in uniform. They're still in the service. 
So they're reluctant to do anything that might, imp might uh, trouble their, their military career. So they're reluctant to generate a psychiatric record. What they want is just to be able to sleep without having to use alcohol. So my biggest activity with them is trying to help them sleep. Do they want to talk about this? Well, what if you're going to go back to Afghanistan in a year? Do you want to get into this stuff? Do you want to dig down into this pain and be in a vulnerable state when you go after, back into Afghanistan in a year? And also, they're young. And they say, it's just going to go away. You just help me sleep, Doc. We don't need to talk about it. It'll just go away. OK? And you know, it's interesting. When I first started seeing these, I would talk to the, my older vets about this. And I'd say, they don't want to see me very much. And they said, oh, we were just like that when we came back. Don't worry about it. Give them a few years. <laughs> Give them about 20 years. And they'll, they'll, they'll want to talk about it. So they want immediate help. So I have a different kind of a technique. I had to learn. First, I had trouble because they were all my kids. You know, they were all so young. They were younger than my children. So I had a little kind of parental transference to them, and I was too intrusive, and I had to back off after a while because I was trying to save them and rescue them all, and it, was, you know, it wasn't effective and it wasn't helpful. Uh, but uh, what I do is I try to do one useful thing every time they see me. Uh, just something useful, something basic. Uh, get them an eye exam if they need it. Uh, get them a hearing exam because they've got tinnitus and ringing in their ears. Uh, give them one of the lab results that they needed to know about. Uh, you know, provide them with a useful reference for something. I have a, I have a guy who has started a veteran from this war who started a great business taking care of the lawns of homes that are in foreclosure. So he's working for the big banks that have all these. And he just he gave me his card, and he said, anytime you see somebody who's out of work who's a vet, give him one of my cards. I'll try to put him to work. So I just try to do useful things for him, and I wait. Now, do some of them want to talk about this stuff? Occasionally, some of them do, like that young man I talked about who I saw in June who's thinking about those things. But that's more rare than the usual. I saw, I thought I saw another, yes? Well, we'd have to s decide to stop going to war against each other because you can't get ordinary human beings to kill a member of their own tribe. So, you know, you just can't do it. So you've, you, you, most, of us, most of us are wise enough to know that we're all human beings, and we've got to accept the propaganda. I mean, we, that we've got to hate them. We've got to, initially, we've got to see them as a, as a, as a less than human menace. I don't see any other way to do it. You just can't go up and pop somebody who's not like that until you're actually in the situation and you're fighting to keep each other alive and you're fighting to accomplish a mission and then you'll, then you'll do it for that reason. But, but initially, to get people to go, the Army says that the games, the video games where you kill each other have really advanced their ability to get people to kill each other. So they say that, you know, what did my kids have? They had this game where you're walking around, you're just looking down the barrel of a shotgun, and I went in and I saw one of my kids playing that, and you just turn around doors and buy, people come out and you shoot them. We got that game off. I said, no way. <laughs> I don't know what it was called, but we, we stopped that. But the Army says that, that that's really helped them because actually World War II studies suggest that only 20% of the troops would kill the enemy. Only 20%. And you had to get, you know, Bob's daughter told me after she had her, they have a, this thing when they go over to Iraq, uh, they, have to, they do sh crash and bang, crash and bang. They learn how to shoot guns and drive cars in an evasive manner. And if you're riding, you're not usually driving a car, but if you're riding and your driver gets shot, you have to learn how to drive the car from the passenger seat with the body there uh, at high speed in an evasive manner. And she said to me, well, I think I can shoot somebody if I have to, if they're trying to kill me. And I didn't say anything to her, but I said, Shari. <laughs> You know, if you're faced with having to shoot somebody, I'm sorry, but I think you'll just let them kill you because you're just such a nice person. And, uh, you, you know, unless you had a baby in your arm, then I think sure I'd shoot him. But if it was just her, I'm not sure she would. Sorry, Bob and Delsa, but hopefully she'll never be in that situation. Yeah. Uh-huh.
Yeah. 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 Yeah, a, an experienced person. Here's the one thing that I, I treated a man once. It was kind of a, I didn't really treat him, but he he spent time with me in my office. He didn't need me to treat him, but he spent time with me in my office. And he was a very successful combat arms officer, and he'd had a lot of previous men in his family who had served in combat. And one of the things that they impressed upon him is don't let your troops do things that they would regret doing the rest of their lives. And so he fought a very clean war in many ways, as clean as you can. And then when he continued his service, he lost his arm in Vietnam, and when he continued his service in the medical corps, Army Medical Corps after that, he did something that he called hip pocket training, which is <clears throat> he would identify all the combat veterans in his unit. And he would make them teach a course, each one, identifying <clears throat> the mistakes they had made and the things they had done right. And they'd take the young guys in, and the senior person would say, these are the kind of things I did wrong, and these are the kind of things I did right. And it was tremendously therapeutic. That's not exactly what you're talking about, but it has some similarities. So he, takes, he took their combat experiences, and he turned them into positives. And, and whenever you take that kind of horrible experience or difficult experience, and you can use to teach others to help them avoid or teach each other to avoid mistakes, that's a powerful therapeutic tool. So I don't know that, you know, some people, when they say we don't have PTSD, they're just saying we don't have PTSD for the time they're in the service, right? So, but let's look 20 years after they were out of the service. Let's see what's going on. Let's look 10 years after out of the service. And almost none of the studies have that. So... We have some data from Israel that say the Israelis don't have as much PTSD as we do. Uh, <clears throat> but we also have some data that says they have more PTSD. So I'm a little leery of those kind of studies uh, because unless I see them myself and I see what the time course is. But that task you're talking about is helpful, uh, particularly with a non-therapist but with an experienced senior person to talk those through those, I think is very useful. Yes? Uh huh. Yeah. Whatever we. Yes. Yes. I. I think it's totally transferable. I mean, I think the only way we recover from harming other people is to ask their forgiveness. <laughs> it's that simple. I mean, if we harm other people. And we ignore that. We're lying to ourselves. We're lying to the rest of humanity. And we become more hardened. We become more able to do more cruel things and more heartless things. Um, there's an unfortunate human characteristic that when we've harmed other people and we don't want to admit it, we like to blame them for why we've harmed them. They, didn't deserve, they deserved that. And they deserve more if they continue to do that. Or if they don't do this, they deserve more. So, yeah, I think it's very transferable. You have to, you have to recognize what you've done wrong and ask forgiveness of the person you've, if you want to recover. That's what I would say. Yes. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I think it is, yeah. I think it is. It's, in fact, it's, uh, I don't know if you've ever, uh, you, you know who Conrad Lorenz is. Uh, he wrote a book on, on aggression, and he, he, he really talks about how human beings in up close and personal really don't want to do much more than just knock each other down and have somebody say uncle. But if you get them far enough apart, a gun, uh, a bomb, and this distance with the drones. If you get them far enough apart, they can, they can do it with, with uh, less guilt, with less trouble. Uh, 
can they do it with impunity? No, they can't. Uh, most people cannot do it with impunity. So even operating the drone, they know they're killing people. Um, you know, you're dropping bombs on German cities from 20,000 feet. You can't see more than the cities. Yet, you know you killed a lot of people. Uh, and you know what that's like. So I think in the end, we're, we're, we're human enough that even that, even drone killings are going to bother us. Yes? Well, it depends on, it depends on how you're defining it and what you're looking at it. Uh, <clears throat> there is a group of um, a psychiatrists who published what at the time was a top secret study about the 8th Air Force in World War II. Now, the 8th Air Force in World War II was a huge operation. It was doing daylight bombings over Germany. We're talking the 8th Air Force alone suffered as many casualties as we suffered in Vietnam. So there was, there was 40,000 killed and 30,000 prisoners of war in the 8th Air Force. Uh, and we're not talking about the wounded uh, during World War II. Though it might be the reverse, it might have been 40,000 prisoners of war and 30,000 killed, but I think it was 40,000 killed and 30,000 prisoners of war. Uh, and initially they had to do 25 missions. And the chances of you surviving 25 missions was about 5%. And the troops, the airmen pretty much learned that, um, that your chances were pretty low in surviving that. Yet they would keep getting on the planes despite that. Now I've lost the tray. Now I've lost your question. Oh, yes. Okay, so these psychiatrists, thank you, Teresa. These psychiatrists studied the men who survived. And 95% of them met the criteria for combat fatigue, which was their, their, their symptom constellation for PTSD. So 95% of them, as they were going home, met that criteria. Now, the current data in the Army is that about 20% of the combatants have what we call clinical PTSD. Now, but clinical PTSD means that you're having trouble doing your, living your life. You're having trouble doing your job, okay? Do 80% of them not have symptoms? No. No, we know that about 50% of the Army can't sleep right now, okay? So at least 50% of them are having sleep disturbance from their war experiences. How much more? It's hard to say. If you're wounded, your chances of having clinical PTSD are about... 30%. If you just go into the combat zone, you know, the, the rate of PTSD in the civilian population is about 6%. If you go into the combat zone and come back out after one tour, you're likely to have the rate from some of the studies, the rate of PTSD in the troops goes up to about 16, 17, 18%. Uh, uh, what if you do it three, four, or five times? Actually, it's interesting. When you get to about 20 uh, firefights, the incidence of PTSD doesn't go up anymore. You kind of you kind of get to a point you're, you're inured to it. You just the group stays there. So you got about 20% that are having trouble functioning. You got about 50% that are having trouble sleeping. D, you know this Eighth Air Force study said that 95% of the men had symptoms enough to give them the combat battle fatigue. How long does it take for those for you to recover from those symptoms? Um, what happens? You know we're going to find out because. We're going we're gonna to be fighting this war, this, this current set of wars, for a long time, I think. So, we quitting? Yeah? Okay, I'm happy to stay and talk to you if you have any questions and whatever. Thank you. Let's You're welcome. Give a round of applause. Thank you. Larry is going to hang around and please come up and he can sit around the table with you. Sure. Group or Talk to individuals. Yep. So, please, and we'll be getting together in another month or so. Pizza's gone.